Welcome back to the Levity Zone. After a three-month break, when yours truly, Dr. Bruce, traveled on a magical mystery tour of scientific labs in the East and a festival in the West, the April scientific tour with my collaborator and mentor, Professor David Deemer, brought to key colleagues our new hypothesis for how life may have begun on the early Earth some four billion years ago. I am proud to say that this hypothesis is now in publication as an essay in the scientific journal Life. In May, I gave a daytime talk and an evening spoken word performance at the Lightning in a Bottle Festival. This performance was a groundbreaking collaboration between myself and visual artist Android Jones and musician DJ Dissolve. Find links to the scientific essay and the festival performance at the entry for this show, number 48, at www.levityzone.org. I now take great pleasure in presenting Primal Theory, a four-part studio session with Duran Dassu, recorded one fine day in May of 2012. This is totally timely, as in this conversation, set to music by composer Mental Physics, I wax poetic on the primordial thinking which later came to underlie my work on the origin of life. My naive musings on the origin of the cosmos come next. By this I mean the underlying event and system that led to the Big Bang and the emergence of life itself. These were drawn from an as-yet unpublished 2012 book chapter called The Golden Universe. You can also find that chapter, the source of this episode's cover art, at the Levity Zone site. I finish with musings on the nature of life and God in the cosmos, and a logical argument for what God really is. These conjectures can also be found in a book chapter called The God Detector, published in a book back in 2009 for Charles Darwin's Bicentenary. So thank you, dear friend and neighbor Duran Dassu, for such wonderful prompting questions and dialogue back in the studio at the Blue Lotus Temple of Sound and Light. So do you think rhythm or organic rhythm, 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 rhythm? Threshold point for sentience, 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 What we call alive, 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 The earth is a rhythmic place because of the moon. So the moon was formed by a collision, like a Mars-sized object came in one day and four billion years ago and slammed into the earth and then it spun off and this thing was going around and around like a huge basketball and like a bouncing basketball it went further and further out its orbit went far out until it was synchronized until there was one face pointing toward the earth and as a result of that that's the fundamental rhythm then you had tides and you had these cycles that were driven by the moon, also driven by the Earth traveling around the sun, because the Earth was tilted axis. But it was tilted because of this collision. So those are your fundamental beats of life. So what that means is that a, a tidal pool will fill and drain and fill and drain and fill and drain and evaporate. And you get an atmosphere and things are cycling and cycling. And when you start getting life, Life exists because of cycles, because of rhythms within rhythms. Autocatalytic sets, where one molecule will form into another molecule, which will form into a bunch of other ones, which will then form into a bunch of other ones, which will then generate the original molecule. So things go around and around. And there are these cycles of products being pumped off. And then there's the rhythm of the bag, of the lipid bilayer sac that contain the first cells and the rhythm of things pulsing in and out through the membrane and the membrane dividing and dividing again. It's all rhythm. But you need complex rhythms within rhythms to make life go. So every organism is like a musical instrument, actually. It's like a symphonic orchestra. It's a very good analogy. 
And there's the mega rhythm of, of evolution, of things striving into niches and being beaten back, and you get things that fly. So 300 million years ago, you had dragonflies with three-foot wingspans, and they filled this niche, and they would come along, they would fly along and catch prey out of the middle of the air. But that prey was um, other insects, big ones. And then the insects got beaten back, but the rhythm of, of having a big flighted thing was still there. So you had the flying dinosaurs, the flying lizards. And after them, you had the birds, the feathered dinosaurs. So niches, ecological niches are like, they're like little one act plays that organisms jump on the stage and fulfill. And they live out that life that that niche requires. But think of a three foot dragonfly coming at you, take the apple right out of your hand. So anyway. One of the things that I've been working on for the last three years is, is an idea of cosmogenesis. How did the universe start? And the fundamental pattern that it had to have when it started. Because if you see that pattern, it might explain how life started. That the pattern that was at the very beginning of the cosmos was there when life began. And I came up with this notion that the universe maybe didn't start with this infinitely hot pinprick infinitely dense with a huge amount of particles in it. It started basically cold with one particle. But the particle would go on forever. It was just a happy particle with a 100% probability of existing. And then one day there was a wiggle and the wiggle said, the particle no longer has a guarantee of going on. You know, this is a terrible situation. And this is a very simple universe. Particle, no guarantee of existing in the next moment or in a million moments. Then time is born as soon as that improbability comes in. That's the idea of time. And so what does a particle do? You know, what would you do if you had one copy on your hard drive of your most precious songs? You'd make a backup copy just in case. So this particle spins off a backup. And then the backup can't be in the same location as the original because then it's just the single particle again. So when they separate, they have to separate in an optimal way and that way I worked out as the Fibonacci spiral because they're doubling and tripling and quadrupling the distance when they separate but they don't have a guarantee of where they're going so there's a little wobble in their trajectories and so they trace a spiral to keep as far apart as they can so then they double again they, they create more particles which double again and double again and you get what you'd call a fluorescence the, the essence of the universe in the beginning is like a flower pattern it's like an echinacea or a sunflower just unwinding and that goes on for a while and that's the birth time of the universe is this beautiful fluorescence of these spirals and then the noise in the past overwhelms them and shakes apart and then suddenly you have this phase of chaos and in the chaos come untold numbers of particles colliding and joining up and that's where you get the subatomic particles coming. But in the beginning, there was this perfect order. And if you see slow-mo films of any bomb blast, it's always this perfect sphere up until a point, like a nuclear blast. And then there's chaos overwhelming it. And then it goes all chaotic. So the thinking I had when I wrote this model was that the universe breathes in order and it exhales chaos. So when the universe takes a breath and it forms something like a solar system, there's beautiful order in it. There's these winding numbers of the orbits. But when it gets ready to exhale, when, when a star goes nova, it's going to exhale chaos. And that we as creatures, we do the same thing. We're creatures of the golden mean or these spirals or the symmetries, but we're ever at the edge of extinction. We're ever creating chaos. We create war. We destroy our environment, but we then create order at the same time. So the, the ultimate rhythm in the universe is possibly 
this inhaling of order and exhaling of chaos. That is the primal rhythm. So in a sense, human beings should accept that we have to live with the chaos and, and the edge of extinction that we are always at. Because we pay that price because we do so much ordering. We do too much. So we order the planet with monocrops. We pump out lots of pollution, change the atmosphere because we're trying to create more products and more highways and more asphalt. And we're trying to put order on the universe. And as a result, the chaos results. And you get breakdowns, but that's the price. It's, it's a breathing in and a breathing out. In some sense, music is the highest creation of, of human beings in a way. Because music's sort of at that edge between order and chaos. To my mind, there was music in the birth of the universe when it was in that fluorescence pattern. You can't hear it anymore, but it was there. And when we listen to music or when we see a flower, phylotaxis, when we see art and we see beauty and we hear these rhythms and symmetries, we're actually tuning into the cosmogenesis. That's our heritage. And the funny thing is that where does this order come from? It's being made all the time. And why? Because the initial two particles that doubled themselves and, and separated, that's the one event that's happening over and over again at the lowest level all the time. There's an uncounted number of those simple particles, but they're always trying to separate. They're always trying to separate. And they always will therefore express this pattern. And this is way below fermions. It's way below the electron. It's the, the bits and pieces that make up those. You know, and does this account for quantum theory? No, it's just a vision. It's a uh, thought experiment. But that at the lowest level, there's this constant attempt to recreate the original cosmogenesis event over and over and over again. And that's why we see these patterns at the higher level. And for them, no time has passed. And there is no difference in what was at the very beginning. It's like prime cause. Like prime cause? Yeah. Yeah. The pro the, this is what drives the rhythm. The rhythm, the rhythm, the rhythm. The rhythm. Life falls out of this, and, and here's how it works. I wrote a book chapter, and there's a lot of great illustrations in the chapter. It's going to be published, I think, later this year. So the question was, is life a trippy, almost unnatural, dreamy, odd property of the universe that suddenly comes into being? Or was there something there before that led up to life that life falls out of? So when you think of it, life is a mechanism to control the movement of molecules, so where some molecules control the movement of other molecules in a predictable way. So a genome controls how a cell works and when it divides and what should go in and out of it. And it's a program, but it's a program made out of the same stuff that it's controlling, which is other molecules. It's a weird thing. Why should this emerge on its own? Does it make any sense? So I went back to cosmogenesis and I said, well, what property would be there that would lead to life? And like what you just said, I came up with this idea of the primal law. The way it works is whenever possible, things try to avoid each other. And this is something that's quite obvious when you're driving in traffic. People are just not sort of slamming into each other and animals tend to sort of avoid each other. And fundamental particles tend to avoid colliding. Uh, and this is so ubiquitous that we don't even think about it. But if you look at it, it's, it's a fundamental property that's not characterized by science. There's something going on in Brownian motion when you see things wiggling around. Particles generally are avoiding each other. And so if you go back and say, well, cosmogenesis was an attempt by two particles, both of whom had a probability they wouldn't make it, separating then they're seeking these pathways of lower probability of annihilation. And it turns out, here's the other side of it, if two particles came at each other fast enough that they couldn't get out of each other's way, what happens is, in this model, is that the particles kind of climb up this risk ridge 
this mountain up to where they're going to collide and there's nothing else they can do, what happens to them is all the alternative pathways disappear, such that there are, there is only one pathway. And it may be to annihilation. They may just be annihilated through the collision. But there is another path, which is if they associate and they take the same path, which means being joined, they collectively lower the probability of annihilation because two particles connected, when they get something slamming into them, they're more likely to make it than two particles on their own getting slammed into independently. So they find a way to satisfy this primal law by ironically being in proximity and joined, joined at the hip. And this leads to life because what that means is the universe favors associations, even though they're risky. So in a star, when you have you know protons and neutrons slamming into each other and the fusion, but you have a lot of destruction, but the star is ever making more and more associations. It's making helium, it's making silicon, it's making iron, and then it blows up. It can't sustain that, and they, they blow off all the material, but the net gain for the whole system, for the primal law, is now there's a lot more associations. And then comes the freaky thing, the birth of permeable membranes. Permeable membranes are, are a very weird thing in the universe. They're rare, but they exist in primordial oceans because asteroids bring the building blocks called lipids. They come in from space, and this is what Dave Deemer at UC Santa Cruz proved that in an asteroid called the Murchison meteorite that fell in Australia, if you scrape a bit of it off and put it in solution, you find lipids. The lipids form these weird structures, and what the structure is that the tail of the lipid is afraid of water, doesn't like water. The head's okay. It's attracted to water. So what happens is lipids tend to line up with a head pointing toward water and, and another head on the other side of another lipid pointing toward water and the two tails talking to each other. That's a lipid bilayer. And that's what we're made out of, mostly. And these lipid bilayer membranes are one of the weirdest things in the universe. And it's because of them that we're here. And why? These lipids come together in water and they form these two layers heads on the outside, tails on the inside, and they're kind of wiggly and everything. And the, the molecules actually flip around like corkscrews. They're just constantly on the move. And as a result, other molecules can wiggle their way in between and get through certain sizes of molecules, all kinds of different molecules. And these lipid bilayers, they form sacs or vesicles, they would call them in science, or protocells, some of the people call them. But there's an inside, there's some water and junk on the inside, and there's stuff on the outside. But moving across this membrane are molecules. When you think about that, stones don't give you such a bizarre behavior. That there's this subtle thing that can accept new members. So new members can get inside. When they get inside, they are, quote-unquote, satisfying the primal law because they're a little more protected. They're in this sack. So as a result, there's this subtle draw of molecules that come up against this membrane and they fall into the association of being inside the sack. So there's this subtle draw of association and as a result, sacks are favored. They satisfy this primal law of non-annihilation even before they're living because they're just sacks of stuff. And they're made out of molecules that satisfied the primal law, which are made out of subatomic particles which came together to, to satisfy that law. And so life is a progression, but a lipid vesicle is a massive molecular machine, even though it's not living. There could be billions of atoms in there. So then the trick starts. So why does that become life? These sacs, most of them break up. Wave action happens. There's a vibration in the water, and these sacs just burst. They're like used cars. They're just conking out all the time. So if ever a sac emerged that persisted basically forever, it would have a huge draw on the primal law. It would be an association that, that goes on, and all the members will go on, and they will achieve this protection from annihilation 
slight advantage indefinitely. So the whole system favors the emergence of an eternal bubble, a bubble that divides and never pops. And this is what the Genesis Engines project is about. It's about building machines that can get us to the point where we witness eternal bubbles. So how does this happen? Well, so you've got this funky thing called a membrane. It's growing all the time. It's always just pulling in new lipids that are floating around. So the thing grows and grows and grows and gets this long elongation thing like a party balloon that you blow up to make a dog out of. And it will then divide and create two daughter sacs. So their divisions for free. They're happening all the time. But then those daughter cells or daughter sacs will break up. Boom, they're gone. So how do you do the trick of keeping them around? Well, there has to be a collection of molecules on the inside that controls when that division happens, when that thing wobbles apart. And if the control can be exerted, then those daughter cells, protocells, are going to live for longer, maybe long enough that they'll do the division again. That's all you need. So some collection of molecules inside of a sac controls and, and makes sure that membrane doesn't pop. And it has to make a copy of the molecules that get into the daughters. So it has to make enough of them that they're propagated forward inside the two daughter cells. And there you have it. Then the true magic thing happens. If you get these vesicles or these sacs that are doing this division trick, and at least one of them goes forward and divides again, if there's another type of these protocells that's doing the division trick, but with a slightly different range of molecules in it, they might start competing just by accident. They're taking up material from broken sacs and whatever. So there's pressure. So there are two lines of bubbles now. One line divides quickly, say, and the other line makes big bubbles that have a lot of contents. And as it divides, it does it slower. Well, the bigger, slower one might start using up the junk from the ones that divide quickly, and a lot of them pop. And so the big one's happy because it's got all these this new material. It has no idea, or there's no sensing, there's no idea that there's another strategy, there's another type of bubble in the environment. It's just picking up all the, the leftovers. So then suddenly the little bubbles have less material to work with. So then they are selected for. So the best little bubble that can deal with less material suddenly divides more and takes over. And then you have something called Darwinian natural selection. And that's the magic. It's competition that culls out failed experiments and allows ones that are a little bit better to go forward. And that's, that's the pathway to a living system. And it all comes from this primal law of association and lowering risk. <laughs> a long-winded answer. Yeah, no, I think about that, with the fact that living stuff, again, happens from inequality on either side of the membrane. Something on this side that isn't there on the other side. So the membrane allows it to permeate through, or hmm. doesn't allow it to permeate through. That process, again, seems to somehow be like a prime driver, you know. Not that there is a, mm -hmm. a rhyme or reason to it, but that there's just this constant desire for inequalities to be approaching equality. And that's called an equilibrium state. The best way I've heard it explained is if you have a barrier and you have a high concentration of things on one side and lower on the other, some of the things will tend to go through as if it's a membrane to the other side, and then other molecules will keep going back and forth, and they'll go back and forth until there's the same mixture on both sides. But what it really is, is the rate at which things are going back and forth equals out. So it's the rate across the, the barrier. And then you have equilibrium. That's what they call equilibrium. But nature is, is totally non-equilibrium. That's, that's my point. You know, that all the living stuff seems to arise once it's in non-dynamic then you're in well, mush. You're, an equation, not, you're, you're you know. pure mush at that point. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're like it's a rock or... I mean, I don't know, you know. Even rock is probably not correct because even diet has like <laughs> yeah. layers of stuff going on. But I don't know, but mush is probably... It's better. mush. It's just mush. And why does the universe bother to struggle toward equilibrium states? 
know, chaos, the winding down of things. Things decay. If you pour oil in water, it tends to spread out as evenly as it can, so it becomes more and more uniform. It seems to be like there's a sloughing off down to equilibrium all the time, but then there's this force pushing up and saying, no, no, we shall form quartz crystals, which shall live four billion years, uh, and they are still here, these crystals. That's like, wow, that was a lot of energy to push up to make that quartz crystal, and it can sit in the rocks and be exposed, and you can pick it up as a kid and take it home, and that thing is so old. That thing resists the drive to equilibrium almost completely beyond the lifetime of a planet, whereas a, a crystal of salt isn't going <laughs> to resist that equilibrium for long as it dissolves. I just never know where to draw the meta line. Like, where do you start differentiating things into bits as opposed to it? <laughs> How do you mean? At what point do you start differentiating all these little particles and these little processes as different things? Like Slavia, for example. I, I just think it's a trippy question as to where is, hmm. where did it differentiate? Where did it individuate, so to speak? You know, what if it's still all one thing? Like the entire universe. It's one. And this is a philosophical question, but a scientific one. When life starts, it's almost like the rules change because prior to life the way matter was organized and molecules were shifted around were these laws like on Mars where there may or may not be life but stuff is rolling down a mountainside and it always has rolled down a mountainside you know the mountains degrade and there's talus slopes and there's water weeping out and there's dust storms enormous dust storms and so the whole thing tends to be shaped that way whereas on earth you look down and you see mountains and you see, my God, there's some matter moving up the mountain. And it's a mountain goat. And it's going up for better grazing in the spring or something. And it's moving up against that mountain slope. That's pretty freaky. And so the, the it, the itness of the universe is all that stuff that just sort of happens based on absolutely predictable laws that are the same everywhere. And then there's this thing called life, which is an itness that defies those laws. But it's still of those laws, but it somehow defies it, that a mountain goat climbs up a mountainside. So aliens coming into orbit watching, you know, people, hikers climbing up a mountain would go, uh... <laughs> but then, you know, if they tore apart our cells and our genes and they could render it all down and be explainable that, oh, of course, these are hikers going up the mountain. And it's totally explainable by all the original laws, but it's a long journey. You know, trillions of cells machinery that's driving that hiker and their backpack with their water bottle and their energy bar and everything just so they can go up the mountain. All that stuff, you know, made by factories elsewhere and designed by computers and so that they can what, satisfy a physical urge or an endorphin urge or a visionary urge or something you know, which is a cultural thing. It's uh, pretty trippy. One of the chapters I wrote a few years ago asked the question, if there is a God, would God care to be in a universe with no living systems? Probably not. Right? So God would only be present and manipulate the living world. Well, then what characterizes the ability of God to make a change in the living world? From my reasoning, it came down to Everything about the living world is about making copies. So a successful business makes a mixing board over and over again based on a plan. An author who is successful gets their words copied in books. And organisms copy via genes and proteins and stuff. So making copies. And in, in quote-unquote normal nature, stars don't make copies of each other from instructions. You think it's making copies or passing I think it's making, well, what it has to do is actually copy both the information about making a copy of a big machine and making the next copy of the next machine. So it's the information, but it's the body too. 
So in terms of God, then, you could say, all right, if life is about making copies, whether it's a monk that's copying an early version of the Bible from Aramaic to Greek, uh, what would God choose to influence? What could God do? Well, the thing that makes life in the universe interesting is random changes during copying, random mutations. So the monk may have mistranslated a section of the Aramaic Bible, which created a passage in Greek that said, the young virgin gave birth to the baby Jesus, the virgin girl. And then the, the older monk comes by and said, no, 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 that doesn't mean virgin. In Aramaic, that just means young girl, it doesn't mean virgin. But if the correcting mechanism of the senior monk never came by, that error would go into the Bible, which it did. But it was an advantage because the mythology of virgin births was a big deal in the Mediterranean. And so any new belief system that had a virgin birth at its core is going to be more attractive to followers. So the mutation worked. But did God control the pen, the hand and the pen of that monk or that monk's mind? Can God control randomness? And my argument in this book chapter was randomness is randomness. God would have to be bigger than the universe to know which way randomness was going to go. You just need to be everything. So God can't be bigger than everything plus everything. So God can't control the random mutations. So God could only influence the results of the copying or the results of the error. So out there in the world, an organism reproduces, it has a mutation. The mutation's a benefit. So then it becomes the next great organism in its environment. That's called adaptation. So in fact, if God's power could only happen after the mutation, where things were just kind of figuring out, oh, this is virgin birth, this is cool, and God could be whispering in the ear of the followers, there's a virgin birth in here, but God couldn't control the original mutation, then God is nothing more than natural selection. God is nothing more than that process of evolution. God is evolution. God is adaptation to these random mutations. So they're the same. So what is God and God's power? Science calls it evolution or adaptation, or we call it in industry creativity, competition, all that stuff. And religious people call it God, but it's it's one and the same thing. 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 The same thing.